here. And that should be good. So I'm back with Spirit Man again. Uh, I know some of you guys did not make it through the last very long and in-depth metaphysical conversation we had, and I don't blame you to be honest. Um, why I really wanted to talk to Spirit Man in the first place was I had been told that he is, you know, having uh, a really active movement towards some bigger societal goals. Um, he's involved in that. You know, he's committed to that. Takes it seriously. I also. Uh, consider myself as being actively involved in trying to make the world better and so that's primarily why I had respect for Spirit Man off the bat and I still want to hear what he has to say. Now to preface, um, we're going to kind of talk about ethics today but particularly as applied to whatever projects you have going on and you know basically what is the best way forward for people in our situation in the modern day, applied ethics. But you know, some abstract talk would be good as well. On the abstract side, just to follow up on what we talked about last time, the difficulty that I mentioned with Hegel is the language that Hegel uses regarding the relationship between the infinite and the finite or the unlimited and the principle of limit in Platonism and just basically antique thought in general limit is first and the unlimited is uh it follows and that's sort of like the masculine principle and the feminine principle it look up the pythagorean table of uh categories basically uh to get an idea of like what sort of things fall under that domain of limit and what falls under the domain of the unlimited and that uh, pertains to the ethics that follow from Platonic metaphysics. For me, metaphysics is really useful fundamentally because it informs us about the nature of the good and tells us what we should do. And that's kind of the purpose of philosophy, ethics, and then maybe ultimately politics. So that being said, uh, my, my worry is that this emphasis on the unlimited will have negative ethical consequences. But, uh, you know, we kind of debated about that topic does hegel really invert this platonic scheme or what's going on there maybe it's a subtlety of language so i think the best way to find this out for myself is just to hear you know where do you go spirit man with your ethics and applied ethics and how does that follow from your kind of hegelian framework you are very good at this thank you for uh, having me back on uh, i thought our last conversation was really rewarding even though it is a bit abstract but to let the audience know, the reason why the logic is really important for ethics and politics is because the way that the logic constructs itself repeats itself in higher concrete spheres. So politics is just another version of logic. So if you understand the logic, you'll understand the politics on a much more fundamental level, on a more spiritual, more philosophical, more scientific level. Because behind all the messiness of, you know, state constitutions and activist movements and all these, you know, contingent things in the world, under, underneath all of that are these universal movements, these universal movements of spirit is what Hegel calls it. And if you want to try and change the world, you have to get in tune with that. If, you, if your inner world is not aligned with that kind of inner world, then your outer world will be irrational. You'll have... Um, Caprice, you'll have your own sort of limitations imposed upon the people and the, uh, the movements around you, and then they'll collapse upon their own contradictions. And so that's what we don't want to happen. So, you know, that famous saying, to say this in less like abstract language, you know, that famous saying, you know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. That's what it means is that you'll be a do gooder and you'll get out there and think you know the answer, and then all of a sudden the world twists you into your opposite and then all of a sudden you realize you're the one changing because you actually didn't have the wisdom to change the world and that's where gandhi comes in with his famous quote be the change you want to see in the world you know and uh, that's where it's all deriving from is these great leaders are just trying to point us towards this logic inside of ourselves so that we don't make this egoic mistake of thinking we know it all when we try to start a movement and to actually be open to the truth and change with it as we're changing the world so I think that the abstract has a powerful place here. And I would say that if you understand the logic, it grows itself into Hegelian kind of politics, which I really do think we need at this time, because that's the only kind of complete version of this logic that even Pythagoras was touching upon. So I don't know if I should leave it there or if you want me to go in a certain direction, but 
the abstract and the concrete are connected. Yeah, of course, as is the case with Platonism, that's how it should be. You know, politics should be the output of logic and the rest of philosophy, ultimately. So where do you go, um, I guess, first in terms of abstract ethical norms and what are the highest level principles, ethically speaking? In Platonism, uh, a, a general feature is the uh, that it has many applications, the kind of synonymy of the one and the good. So Proclus says that all unity, qua unity, is a good. And so when we look in the world, we can judge things to be good or bad whether uh, by whether they unite and harmonize and bring about coherence or whether they do the opposite. So that's probably the highest level principle. Another principle is uh, in common with aesthetics as well, that for uh, something to be good, it needs the correct kind of proportional instantiation of various forms in due measure, right? So establishing proper limits on social roles, social institutions, um, works of art is very important, both ethically and aesthetically. And there is a bit of overlap between ethics and aesthetics in, in Platonism. Um, but I don't want to make this too much of a Plato versus Hegel kind of uh, framing. But in any case, what are some of those kind of highest level ethical principles? And then maybe if you could bring that down to like how we can judge whether a particular thing is for the good or for the bad on that basis. Um, uh, ma'am, home run there. Good stuff. <laughs> I would say that the highest principle, there's really only one uh, that unifies all the others, at least in terms of this more genuine philosophical interpretation of what it's all about. And it's genuine freedom. So the point of it all is liberation. Hmm. And for Hegel, anyway, it's the liberation of your spirit in yourself as an individual, but also as a collective, as a community. And so people will say, well, what is freedom? Freedom. Well, when Hegel's talking about freedom, he doesn't just mean, you know, do whatever you want. It's caprice. You know, you can go and, you know, follow your own will. That's what he calls abstract freedom. So it's still freedom, but there's something abstract about it that has a limit. And he says real freedom is not this abstract freedom because abstractness always has an opposite to it. And then they condition each other. So it's not really free. So the opposite of abstract freedom, caprice, is necessity. So that's a determinism you can kind of think of it. So those two condition each other. They kind of go at odds. But he says real spiritual freedom is when you sublate those two and treat them as moments that interchange into each other at their extremes. They limit each other. So to be free of the limit is to sublate into genuine freedom, which is the freedom from abstract freedom, which sounds paradoxical, and necessity as one concrete whole. So the necessity and your free will are lined up together. And in Christianity or in Buddhism or in other deep divine truths, they touch upon this with providence and, you know, following your destiny and there's a path for you and, and you can deviate from that path if you want. That's caprice. But when you really find who you are spiritually, that inner spirit coming through you in this life, you align with the good. It's your highest potential. And the reason why we can say that is because when you align with the logic, this deeper spiritual logic, it brings your thinking into alignment with your being and your being changes the world with your thinking via the idea. And it's, it's like Plato's idea, right? It's the perfect reason. The, it's the thing thinking itself in the super sensuous realm. We can call it God. We can call it source. We can call it Allah. We can call it whatever we want to call it. But this thing is perfect reason making its way through our abstract world through us. And our consciousness is a return to that kind of logic, but it's in a fragmented form at first. It's like glittering in us. But when you're really aligned with that, incredible things start to happen. Very powerful spiritual things that Jesus was telling us about. You know, he said, if we, if we understand him and believe in him, believe in the way, the truth, and the life that he was, then you will, we will do greater things than he. That's crazy coming from somebody claiming to be God, right? Like that's, that means we're going to be doing God-like things. Mm -hmm. and now it makes okay, sense. I don't want to get too far, you know, off the beaten track. I would like to just kind of rein it in and understand these higher level principles. Because from what you've said, I don't know what that looks like yet. And it doesn't kind of tell me 
what society should be, what our aesthetics should be, what our kind of personal habits should be. So maybe we can apply this kind of higher level freedom that you're talking about, this sublated freedom, to things like, you know, everyday ethical problems that people face, problems of like moderation and, you know, is asceticism fundamentally right? And should we abstain from bodily pleasures? Should we maximize pleasure? Like, what does it tell us in terms of utilitarian calculus and in terms of like, you know, what sorts of activities we should engage in? What does that highest freedom ironically tell us to do? It means to think in those proper proportions that you mentioned earlier. So when you're moving through your life, you're going to come up against limits and you're going to want to negate them. And that negation, creating the other, is really creating all the tension in our lives. So the real root of oppression, the real root of all the badness in our lives, the real root of amorality, crime, is really not understanding who we are as pure thought. So understanding ourselves as pure thought is really the problem. I, means you I, again, I'm sorry, but this isn't telling me what to do. Let's, you have a tendency to go off on a bunch of different directions. I just want to like, you know, have the question answered. Well, I'll is it let's just the one question is asceticism good or bad because saying it's you know flowing through your activities you could do anything and flow through your activities is anything then good right so this is yeah so it comes down to those proportions and asceticism at least in buddhism you know buddha had the right proportions but he had to go to the extremes to find it so he realized that this othering isn't the answer. So he articulated this proportionality as the middle way, right? But don't mistake the middle way for, for the middle ground between opposites. That's no man's land. So you have one extreme, two extremes in the middle ground. The middle way is not the middle ground. It's the sublation. But of course, we didn't have that kind of language back then. It's the reasonable point that dictates where on any extreme you want to be based on reason. And we need to return our culture to that. So practically speaking, you, as that... Gandhi principle be the change you want to see in the world to attain, attain, achieve this higher genuine freedom in yourself as an individual first you have to learn to love other people that you don't like you have to learn to stop that negation process that abstract negation and then negate that negation in that genuine freedom that's also known as metacognition but there's this fundamental deeper logic where it's happening all the time if you can't do that anything you start up will twist into its opposite so understanding abstract negation in yourself is the first step now practically speaking once you can do that, you start becoming a leader. Spirit starts making you a leader, and you can start attracting teams because spirit calls the spirit out in other people, the goodness in other people. And you want to help create a community that's fair, where other people can start overcoming these abstract negations to find themselves. So the kind of institutions we need uh, as a state, as a society, have to embrace this principle of always allowing people to learn who they are and not keeping them constrained in external uh, preoccupations. There's an internal world and an external world, and the current world that we're in is mostly external, which is why we're in incredible pain. Now, our connections are mm -hmm. superficial. Okay, okay so, so what, what the one principle that I have gotten from you that I like is, okay. you know, consistent with Platonism, love others, love your enemy, you know, but from like the Bhagavad Gita, right, Sometimes you do have to do violence to others out of duty, out of this is your proper dharma. That's the, you know, problem that Arjuna faces. He doesn't want to attack his cousins on the other side. Krishna, uh, in the guise of the charioteer, tells him, you know, basically this message that, you know, you can have that love at a deeper metaphysical level while, like, pragmatically actually having very well-defined borders and differentiate because if you don't if you have no borders like obviously in in terms of the structure of society things kind of homogenize you know you don't have uh good you can't have like systematic laws if you don't have these borders at certain places so initially the hegelianism here seems again to emphasize a freedom and an unlimitation which is a kind of left-hand path in perennialist terms and it is in the indefinite dyad column in Pythagoreanism and Platonism. So from what I've heard, I don't like the general message, but I do agree that you should love your enemy. But this kind of business of finding yourself, I'm curious, you know, what exactly that means. Do we have some kind of already established essence in ourselves that should be respected? 
because there's an element of truth to that. There's also a way of misconstruing that. So maybe you could expand on this process of discovering who you truly are, and then how does that amount to you exercising that freedom? And ultimately, you know, what do you what do you do with that freedom, uh, ethically, aesthetically, in terms of the sorts of actions we should be engaged in? Right. So I, I suppose when I was talking about this dialectical process, you mentioned aestheticism, which means like pulling away from carnal needs. But the reality is, Buddha said that's not really where, where the real truth is. But same with indulgence. You don't want to indulge in total, total hedonism. He says the way, like knowing when to do either one, is the wisdom. So I think when we are aligned with real limitations, so you're right, there's the tricky thing about Hegel is he doesn't fall into the oppositional dyads or whatever you're calling them. He says that that first level is necessary, the dyad or the finite moment of logic. There's always a finite moment. You have to go through that moment to get to freedom. But genuine freedom doesn't have this oppositional dyadic kind of limitation. Genuine freedom includes those limits in it, but it's always transcending them to circle back around on itself. So instead of being some like weird, you know, infinite, never ending thing, that's not genuine infinity. That's just like the bad infinite. So you're right. I don't think we, Hegel is saying we should do this bad infinite process. There's this circling back around when you have the true infinite, the absolute. And then that's in you. So to find out who you are, you're just discovering that kind of logic. And that's why I'll go back to Buddha as my guess, or even Vedic uh, deep truths. They're always kind of circular. And people in our culture, we, we avoid circular logic. It's contradictory. It's sophism. But it's actually the truth. And you have to think of it in the right way. When you do that, what will happen is you'll start getting your confidence that the world makes more sense to you and you'll stop imposing your limits on other people. So I kind of said that before. But what happen is people will feel free around you. So they'll be, no matter who they are, they're, they're allowed to be who they are if it's genuinely good, so it aligns with this logic. But, but wait, okay, so the being who you genuinely are, you referred that to the absolute as who you genuinely are. So in perennialist traditions, that means Atman, the kind of core of the soul, is Brahman, ultimate reality. And the consequence of that is that we should contemplate our true nature. The way to do that is basically, fundamentally, asceticism at its highest level. Uh, but there is like a, a portioning of that principle in the different castes of society. So a warrior caste individual actually does not fulfill his dharma and his like karmic nature um, by being the pure aesthetic, sorry, ascetic. Um, but obviously the priest and the monk uh, kind of fulfill that ultimately. There is a hierarchy of faculties in the mind and someone who perfects like the bodily nature is doing something good, but not as good as someone who perfects our rational faculties and ultimately intellect, which is what allows us to make contact with that absolute. So in order to preserve intellect, to strengthen intellect, we have to remove ourselves from bo bodily desires and distractions ultimately. You know, the condition of pure philosophy is being detached, no urgency, you're not kind of in that fight or flight, uh, an appetitive uh, animal mindset. So detaching ourselves from the animal nature is generally the way to find our true self in the perennialist view. It seems like uh, you're talking about something different. So what does it look like to find that true self? Once you know that it's the absolute, what does that amount to in terms of prescriptions? For me, it is reject bodily desire, perfect the faculties that you naturally have according to this hierarchical scheme that I've talked about before. So what does it look like to find yourself? So the aesthetic moment is, is in that bad infinite. You have to kind of go through that moment to achieve that freedom from it because your drives, like the animal drives are inside of us. That's just the abstract negation, pulling your consciousness into lower, lower forms. And so as we become more conscious, more meta aware as humans, we actually sublate the drives of the animal and become a universal that kind of hovers above it, but doesn't get succumb to it. It chooses where to go. It has the freedom to know, you don't ignore them because you'll die. You have to indulge in them to a certain degree. But when you indulge, is what wisdom is. If you do it at the wrong time, then you're going to hurt people or society. But if you do it at the right time, that's goodness. That's good for you. That's good with society. Again, that doesn't tell me too much. When is the right time to do these things? And when is the wrong time to do them? How do we know that? 
the right time is when you achieve something called uh, flow state for the maximum amount of people to create the maximum beauty of the moment. So when you're doing this, this is why it gets a little bit more concrete in our time. But when you measure flow states, there's actually four criterion um, to create flow states, good games, like uh, cooperative competition. And there's three measured principles, like there's three measurements that tell you when you're in flow. And you can calibrate for that. And so the first one is when you're really immersed with spirit or you're really engaged in your life and make this destiny, you have a feeling of timelessness, oddly. But this universal logic exists, the idea exists in a timeless space, this realm. And you are connected to that. So when you're getting close to that, that's why you experience timelessness in the temporal realm. That's one criterion of flow. You can call it rapture. There's a whole bunch of ways to describe that. The second criterion is you have to be completely immersed in what you're doing. So your your little self and your big self, they're actually blending. You feel connected to the world. You're expansive. But whatever you're doing in action is aligned with your being. It's an immediacy. Your being and thinking start to sublate and merge. Your, your being is your thinking. That kind of thing starts happening. And there's a way to measure that. And the third one is it's intrinsically enjoyable, meaning that it brings you joy from the inside because you're being your full self. You don't need an external, I'll pay you 100,000 to do it. This is what human beings are living for. So you can create those three conditions. That's what we're all living for. That's what genuine freedom feels like. So to do that, you have to create games in society. So this is where the individual leadership style grows into the, the movement, the activism part, where I think you and I are sort of aligned. How you create good games is based on these flow criterion. So one is, all good games have to have clear goals. All good games have to, number two, immediate feedback to the players. Number three criterion is that the challenge level of a job that you give somebody in the game has to match their skill level, not too low, not too high. And then the fourth one is you have to have clear rules. So if you look at our societies today, they're not very, they're not structured like that very well. Anxiety and depression are going up because they're all mismatched in some way. And one of the most important ones, that last one, clear rules, Hegel says, if you're gonna be a great leader, he says the greatest leaders in history were the leaders that made their laws known and easily, easily learnable to the public. And I thought that's a bizarre thing to say, but now that I see how the logic evolves through you know, politics, uh, it evolves through school, it evolves through the family, it evolves through then um, civil society, um, the police, the corporation, then it gets into like law. Actually, it gets to law first, and then I think it goes into um, higher levels of politics. It's all the logic evolving, but it's the same game dynamic. And if you don't know the rules, your citizens can't get into those flow states very well. So a very practical thing we can do is just make the law understandable to our people. And one way to do that is to show this underlying logic, which is way simpler. Our laws are really crazy, and they're called contingent. Um, they're just like a case-by-case -case basis. But the real law, is actually this sort of triadic oneness. Like that's what the Trinity was supposed to be in Christianity. It's way simpler and like children can learn it. And when you learn to recognize that, Hegel calls that, that he calls that thinking in the notion of things. That means the concrete universal logic of every bit of society in the, uh, of reality in the idea. So to think in these notions, notion by notion by notion, thinking of holes in the parts, that's what syllogisms are, real syllogisms are. They're the living kind that grow into each other. So we need to teach people to think that and then make the law knowable and then create those flow state games. And that's a big discussion. I'm not, not sure if you want to drill into one of them, but any kind of activism okay. is just focusing yeah. on one of those four. Um, so the last point about having laws that reflect the underlying logic of reality, I'm totally fine with. I'd like to hear more about what the content of those laws would actually be though. Like what sorts of things are allowed, what is not allowed. That's what laws tell you. Um, but yeah, I disagree in a sentence you'd like, what's up? I can answer that in one sentence. If you'd like me just to address that real quick. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. The one, the one thing that's not allowed technically is something called one sidedness. So we just need to get rid of or sublate one sidedness. That's very practical. That's what we need to do. Okay. That again is saying basically any, to use like modern uh, salient social problems that people are talking about. So like, you know, transgender story hour for children is fine then. Everything 
whatsoever socially in terms of social policy, pu- you know, public morals is fine as long as you avoid one-sidedness. I think that is itself one-sided. Also, the flow state, maximizing flow state is not what like uh, general psychological health is about. Uh, many people do not sufficiently enter into flow states in their work environments. That's one of the leading causes, I think, of video game addiction in people is it has these well-defined rules, etc. cetera. Uh, but you could play video games all day and be in the flow state all day. That doesn't amount to a good life. And I do understand the flow state. I've looked into this stuff myself as well. I'm a musician. Being a good musician is impossible unless you're doing it in the flow state. So you have to learn how to access the flow state. But that's not the only important kind of cognitive uh, facility that you need to develop. You also need to develop insight, which is reformulating the problems that you're facing. So well-defined goals is good for the flow state. Well-defined goals is not good for insight. So you need to be able to break the flow state, stop what you're doing, deliberate and examine at a higher level, like kind of go to the meta level problem space. And you're not going to be in the flow state if you're doing that adequately. You know, like good philosophy should not be written in the flow state. We see books like that. It's people who claim to be mystics or mediums who like transcribe messages from other beings and that this sort of thing is flow state writing, automatic writing. You don't get philosophical genius from automatic writing, writing in the flow state. Philosophical writing needs to be deliberative, slow, you know, not kind of this ongoing uh, kind of process like the flow state. So that's my take on what you've said, but let's go more into what laws we should have um, and what values we should have like aesthetically, maybe take this to aesthetics. In my opinion, like musically, the, the right kind of music is the music that reveals the limiting features of music theory, the nature of the intervals themselves, the numerical ratios involved, the simpler ratios sound better. We define them to be more consonant. And so if you can make salient to people the way in which these very simple patterns can be combined to form harmonies, melodies, rhythms, and the overall composition, that's good music. It's it's making transparent the nature of the limitations of the medium. Um, not like unbounded whatever you want to do, because that can lead to cacophonous, dissonant, really I, what I take to be evil music that brings about a weakening conditioning uh, condition of the soul. So good music has that property. I mean, good visual art likewise will bring about like that, the limiting factors of human perception. That's why the Greeks would like sculpt in different proportions to preserve that ideal symmetrical ratio in appearance for the human eye. Like it's, it, or like, uh, what's the architect? Vit- Vitruvius, um, the Roman architect who wrote his treatise. It's it's all about like bearing in mind the proportions of the human body and these limitations that we have and then having our art and architecture and all of that reflect these human limitations so what i'm hearing from you seems to be very anti all of these limitations and allowing anything whatsoever aesthetically or culturally to come to be and i think that would be bad yeah you're absolutely right that is bad so i think you're maybe misunderstanding the scope of what i'm saying and it's, it's easy to do because it's, it's hard to grasp that genuine infinite first. Like when before when I said we have to sort of be careful with one-sidedness. So to unpack that a little bit, you're right. To understand that one-sidedly is another problem, right? So what you need to do is not negate one-sidedness as a whole. You need to turn them into moments. And then that sort of paradoxically resolves one-sidedness because they move into each other. That approximates this genuine infinite. So I would say that's the proper way to think about how to transform real one-sidedness of fixity, which is trying to get rid of its opposite, into a moment. And that's the right way to do that. And I would say I would say that in terms of aesthetics, um, so how to think about it is the logic, this deeper spirit, this underlying essence of things, the truth of things, these real limitations, the necessity that's opposite, let's say, caprice, that first uh, abstract freedom, that's those kinds of limits. When you sublate those in that genuine freedom, you're not canceling them completely. Sublation means three things at the same time. It's a it's a movement. It's the true movement of spirit. You can think of it that way. It's the essence of wisdom. The movement is the essence of the movement of wisdom. 
and it has the first part, you have to cancel something. But the second part is you have to preserve something in the canceling. And the third part is that you have to raise it to a higher concrete unity of its moments. So that's why genuine freedom is not the canceling of the necess necessary limits, but it's also not the canceling of your caprice. It's only canceling their conditionality on that level, and it's preserving them as moments. So it's getting rid of that one-sidedness without getting rid of them completely. So they're still on one side each, but they're turning into each other fluidly. And that flexibility of thought is what Buddha and all these loving teachers were telling us is don't judge things at face value, explore the dialectic, see what the real living movement is, be in the life. And that's why Jesus came and said the law, you know, in the Old Testament was missing. It was still right. Okay. Still right. But there's something missing. So he came with two more laws. And he says, if you do these two, these are really hard to think outside of because you have to be honest. Love your God with all your mind and soul and spirit. However you do that, do it the best you can. And then number two, that's an internal limit. And whereas the Ten Commandments are an external and you can think around it with your intellect and be all this, you know, do all this clever stuff as a human. And then the second law is, of course, love thy neighbor as thyself. So that's hard, right, to get around because it's another internal law. So I think we need that kind of that kind of thinking that that's that breaks out of that one side of thinking really well and i would say in terms of aesthetics and art this universal true logic at first appears to human beings in the form of art then it develops itself into religion and then into philosophy so wherever you are in your development as a leader as a activist or whatever you want to do to change the world you're probably going to start with art and that's why musicians or or artists, they have to channel. At first, they're not consciously aware of what they're doing. They're just opening their spirit because they're connected and they let it come through the sensuousness. But really, art is just the idea, this concrete universal truth wrapped in really heavy sentiments at first. And you have to be in tune with it to get it right or else you're just doing random stuff like bad music and dissonance and all this. There is a rhythm to things. When you're writing a song, usually there's a home note, then you go away from home and you return. And when you return home, there's something satisfying about that. For human beings those kind of rules are implicit in the infinite plethora of creativity that is art but once you grasp this the the logic more concretely you feel it you can sort of break out of the sensuousness sensuousness a little bit more and enter the second mode of truth which is religion where you're actually there's art there it's like it's like half art and then half pure thought half philosophy and so they're trying to purify thought out of the kernel of sensuousness by thinking it through systematically but it never gets rid of the sensuous element, so it always stays limited in caprice, some kind of human limitation. But it's still in an advancement in some way. They're all beautiful. But then to get to the truth, to get to that true kernel, you have to advance from um, religion to the genuinely free moment, which is not the negation of religion and not the negation of art. It is a sublation, which means a cancellation, a preservation, and then a raising to a higher unity where there are moments turning into each other beautifully. That's what genuine philosophy is supposed to be. That's where genuine reason happens. And you're taking the universal idea that was in art and religion, and you're purifying it completely from sensuousness and grasping it in as pure universal as pure thoughts. The thoughts that don't just think themselves okay. as your thought, but actually think themselves universally. Like with many of the things you've said regarding Hegel's philosophy, interpreted in a certain way, they resonate with the traditional metaphysics, and I'm, I'm fine with them. But uh, that's why I kind of wanted to bring it down to concrete ethics, concrete aesthetics, and how we know that a given work of music or a given you know piece of visual art is wholesome, good, you know, high quality, those sorts of things. And I so I'd like more content in that regard. Yeah, uh, you're pointing in the right direction here, and it is helping me bring this all down because it's enormous. Like once it clicked for me, what Hegel was really saying, it's enormous. So how you know art is good according to him is that it's always about God or it's always about the whole and the parts. So when you're writing a piece of work, uh, a painting, sculpture, dance, the parts have to represent the whole somehow. To think about this in terms of the logic even, if you're a mathematician, maybe you'll like this, but uh, when you have a big amount of something, quantitative amount, you can create infinite amounts of numbers. If you get a chance to look up surreal numbers, anybody who's into this, surreal numbers are just, they're infinite. There's infinites and infinites and infinites and infinites, and people think that's what God is. It's just an infinite, 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 but it's not. God is beyond that. The truth is beyond that. 
you have to sublate all amounts, like the sum total of everything, and then you get to degree. So degree is a higher level of spiritual truth than number. And a degree is defined by the whole. You can't, like if it's, if it's a degree of a circle, you have to know how many degrees there are to know what the degree is, right? So you have to know the whole before you know the part. So that's kind of what art, good art is supposed to do, is when you look at it, it gives you the sense of the whole in the particular. I hope that's a, a relevant combination of things, but he says that's how you know when you're getting the logic right. And in philosophy, when you don't have sensuousness, when it's just pure thought, you arrive at the science of logic. It's literally just the pure thought categories thinking themselves in their true order. And that's what he's doing when you're reading. Right. Table of I mean, that's the claim. Um, I think it's not the ethical way, though, to go about understanding the history of philosophy and going forward to make the kind of assumption that I think you're making in a statement like that, you know, stating it as though it were true. When, like, in our last conversation, it was pretty clear you're not that familiar with antique philosophy. So I don't think morally, you know, you're justified in the level of uh, confidence you put in Hegel. I think if you read Hegel's philosoph history of philosophy, that doesn't mean that you know the history of philosophy. Um, so anyway, I agree with your the principle that you said, though, that you need to see the whole in the part in a work of art, that kind of fractal Mariology is, I think, a very good aesthetic point. It's also a good ethical point and kind of normative social moral point. So that, I guess, I want to take it back to that social level and see, you know, where you stand then on certain issues, like what about the role of men and women? In Platonism, there's a very clear, you know, there's an essence to the masculine nature, the feminine nature, and goodness, if you are a man, means embodying the excellences of the masculine nature. Goodness, if you're a woman, means doing the same for the feminine nature. So swapping between is something that doesn't happen in Platonism. Um, you know, various things that people do today should not happen in the moral society in a Platonic view. So what does what your moral view say about things like that? Particularly, let's just stick to like men and women, the roles of men and women. Yeah, this is where I really started believing in Hegel a lot because in the beginning he looks very uh, conservative and he is to a certain degree. That's why, you know, for 200 years, you can read this guy an atheist and, and liberal atheists, let's say, and, and conservative Christians or religious people are still interpreting him in exact opposites. It's like, how's that possible to read one guy in completely opposite views and they still think they're both right 200 years later? It's because he's writing not in that one side and everything's a moment for him. So the moment of conservatism on the issue of um, gender politics um, is where, you know, conservatives love it because in the very beginning he says this sex divide is the basis of almost everything. It's resulting in all of our social dynamics and all these crazy things, competition. And he says the woman... Um, she has her stronghold in the household. Her education happens there. She doesn't go outside of the state because she can't handle that kind of pain. She's not called to do that. And feminists are like, what the heck is this guy? What the, uh, you know? And then, of course, he says with men, men are called to get out of the family and do state politics. And they, de they develop, like, you know, laws and masculine stuff. And so you look at that and you're like, okay, this guy's antique if you're uh, more, like, liberal. And you give up on Hegel. And so I read that and I was a little bit, you know, kind of blown away that he's so clear about it. You know, he's just like, he doesn't, he's not a bad, he's not trying to do some kind of washing, some kind of weird move. He's just like straight, you, you go here, you go here, and here's why. And I think religious people love that, right? Because it's clear, it makes reality simple in a certain sense. But then it took about 3,000 hours for me to really understand what Hegel was really saying, which is, of course, much more complex than one-sidednesses. Those are one-sidednesses. But he says one-sidednesses have truth to them but it's not the whole truth. So if you're really going to embody the highest principle of ethics, which is genuine freedom, right? Liberation of spirit, you have to rise one level higher than that without destroying them. And he says, they turn into moments, masculine and feminine turn into moments, but they only turn into moments when you think in this living spirit, which means reason. So if you achieve reason, not just abstract masculine reason, that's not real reason, that's just like abstract logic. Real reason is living. It is an alive, genuine reason that is simultaneously emotional and logical at the same time. It's masculine and feminine. And you can break out of your, physiognom your, your physiognomy, is what he calls it, your physical fixity, 
animals are fixed in physiognomy. They don't have the self-reflective loop as deep as we do, so they have to act like their bodies. They can't get out of that. So when we're first evolving, we stick to our male-female roles because that's all we can do. So those roles are real in history. That's why there was a lot of oppression of women and all this stuff happened, but she supported the man. She had power with the family. Those dynamics kind of half-balanced in a certain way that allowed evolution to continue. But I think most people would say that there was a lot of um, disadvantages with that model, that when you have women that are more rational and ready for genuine freedom, they are oppressed. But then you have men that don't have as much reason and they become um, bad state politicians or they become corrupt. So you start to see the limitations of the modes and all that all that really matters, Hegel says, all that really matters is how much you actualize that inner logic. And it doesn't matter who you are, male, female, it doesn't really matter, conservative, liberal, as long as you're thinking with that logic, you can break out of your physiognomy and not destroy the beauty of the moments. But it says without reason, you're just doing that as like, as an abstract moment, like feminazis, for example, are negating men. And then men as a, as a one-sidedness, they want to negate back in that abstract moment. So you get the MIGTO and the male rights movement, and they just rail at each other. That's not a momentary, that's the oppositional. Real activists, real feminists, real uh, male activists, they sublate that and realize all we need to teach is this universal logic. Women can do it, men can do it. So the interesting thing is that Hegel approximates women to the idea, which sounds like a sounds like a, um, a pejorative thing, uh, a disempowerment. But actually, when I read the logic, I realized that the logic ends with the idea. It's the it's the logic concrete. But the problem with women traditionally is that they have the idea better than men do because they're oppressed and the slave who gets oppressed actually has a deeper inward world because they don't have to rely on the external. So these women have a better understanding of the idea. They just can't articulate it logically. So they use a bunch of symbols because they're not allowed to use logic because that's a masculine patriarchal thing. And Hale says genuine philosophy is Sophia. It's for everyone. It's a universal spirit thing. And so okay. we teach women so and men logic then i think we'll get a better harmony all right yeah plato actually emphasizes exactly the same thing with regard to men and women in philosophical terms in platonism always like the highest aspects of things converge the lower aspects are more highly differentiated that's universal to everything in platonism so at the mundane level everyday level masculine and feminine differences should be respected as norms and we should you know clearly define those so that people have archetypes paradigms that they can look to so that they know who they are in in that kind of mundane sense like where do i fit in the world at being born this because to negate that at the everyday level for most people for everybody would just bring about social chaos. You can't let four-year-olds decide whether they're spiritually men or women. It's not, you know, healthy for them. People need guidance. They have historically had these laws that tell them, like, where do I fit in society? What is my role in the, the greater good? Because if everyone has an interchangeable role and there's no definition, you don't actually have, like, a coherence and harmony. That's just like throwing a bunch of paint at the canvas and randomly what lands wherever it may is okay and some people think that's good art and some people think a society where anyone can be anything is good but i don't think that's the case that's not uh you know true uh but like i said in the beginning of this uh response to you um plato does emphasize that the ultimate virtues of men and women are the same and he makes very clear that he wants women to be able to assume leadership roles, that he wants them to be able to participate in the same kind of high-level philosophical training that the men do, as far as the guardians in the Republic and things like that. Um, but there is this difference where at their summits, these natures converge and the excellences converge. But the, the average person is not actualized to that degree. In fact, that cannot be the case because numerically, the bad will always outnumber the good um, because the good is the one, so the bad kind of as the contrary in a certain sense is the many. Um, the, and you know, think about like the way that Aristotle and Plato treat the topic of slavery. 
you know, something like that, it, you're putting people in bondage, you're oppressing them, you're not letting them do what they want. Well, the idea of who is naturally a slave is someone who would benefit by being given these limitations. We know that people are benefited by being limited in certain senses. People go to rehab and they put themselves under strict limitations so that they don't, their own excesses don't get the better of them. So uh, a kind of paternalistic society is recommended then by this kind of classical aesthetic ethical view. Um, and I guess uh, in a certain sense, what you're saying uh, that Hegel says resonates with uh, this platonic equality at the highest level of men and women, but it doesn't apply for most people in that classical view. So does it, should it apply to everyone? Can anyone be anything in the society or should some normative standards be established and even enshrined in law? I would say that uh, if you don't allow people to actualize that reason, that logic, that's the fundamental root of oppression. And it causes one-sidednesses. So if, if a woman feels masculine or she wants to change, he says you have to, unlike Plato's Republic, you have to actually allow an element of that abstract freedom, the caprice moment. That has to have some degree of validity. He's, she says you have to preserve it. And, and uh, Plato wasn't preserving it enough. He was too universal. And Hegel, of course, is about the notion. And the notion always has three elements. It has the universal, the particular, and the individual. So he says his politics, his republic, actually preserves the ability for people to self-determine through the spontaneity of the abstract eye or the abstract freedom that allows it through its own perspective to choose, well not choose, but understand its limit and understand its limit in its way so that it can sublate and understand it within itself. So there's the, I think the answer is when you have genuine reason, you can be anything, but you can explicate the reasons why you're doing that and why it's going to create the most amount of good. So as long as you have, as long as your reason isn't like caprice or whimsical, or it's not based on this like deeper logic, then that's where you're aligning with the law. And the rule of law, Hegel says, is higher than anything. Even though Hegel is blown, like he's uh, chastised for being a monarchist, right? If you read him carefully, the, there's a reason why the king uh, of Prussia um, hired Schelling and all his like, his, uh, his contemporaries to suppress the dragon seed of Hegelianism. Because he Can you give, I looked into that when you mentioned it last time, can you give like a link or something or some reference where you can learn about the historical truth of that? Yeah. So I'll, you want me to send that after this? I will. Uh, okay. Um, it's, it, it was kind of surprising because the king didn't like how Hegel was saying that you, you, you have to restrict some of the rights of the king. The king has absolute power in certain ways. But then there was this like weird constitutional thing that Hegel was squeezing in there because he believed in what Napoleon was doing. And a lot of people think Napoleon was a conqueror and it was bad, but a lot of people see Napoleon as a liberator of this tyranny of abstract rulership to implement the rule of law, the first seeds of the rule of law in Europe, which was, of course, what we now know with democracy today. The system of law is really all that is objective. And then we just have administrators of that and we build it. So he's a huge proponent of that spirit is actually the law and when the law is the most universal and known by the people, the individuals, that's when real spirit advances from states that are based in artistic constitution, religious constitution, and then finally philosophical constitution. And he says the French Revolution in contingent human history was the first moment of liberation from the, the sort of dyad, I guess you'd call it, the opposition between art and religion into the first real moment of freedom in a collective way, the state way. And that's when laws started to become rational. But he also he also berated that because the way they went about purifying the law into pure into pure reason was abstract at first, which is why we got the tear. It was they threw the baby out the bathwater. They got rid of God. They got rid of the whole, and that's without the whole, you get all this abstract stuff happening, like you said, and then people just do a bunch of random stuff that really hurts them in the end. So you have to put in rule of law that is as universal as possible, but does that doesn't um, oppress people's reasoning when they're ready to reason. And it just looks like in history there was a lot of people who were ready to reason, but they weren't allowed to because the the constitutions were too restrictive. So what we're going to do in our modern age is we're going to have a much better mechanism to measure people's reason outside of their stereotypes of fixity and then determine and let them determine through that, that self-determining, that caprice, in that framework where they want to go, which is what uh, Plato never did. He said the guardians tell you what to do. But he says the... 
moment of freedom will always resist that. So he says it's smarter to allow it to happen to within uh, a degree of freedom, right? Well, no, here, here's the logic for that, though, because if this exercising of freedom is and should be in the service of the greatest good, then there should be a correct answer because there is one whole that we're a part of. So there's one way that you as a part should interact with the whole. And I don't think nature in general makes mistakes, right? Um, I think nature is flawed in a certain way in the platonic yeah. sense in that like we have this irrationality and material nature and things like incommensurability crop up in the physical domain. But, you know, it is an image of the eternal. And so in general, what you're born as informs you of that correct way to participate in that one good. And it makes sense that we would all converge on those determinations if we have epistemic access ethically uh, to this decision making in that moment of freedom. Who should I be? What should I be? The individual, there's no rational reason for them to be privileged in making that determination. They might have some internal subjective access to their own states, but if it's about how they should fit into the whole, then the guardians just represents the rational community of society and there should be consensus if the individual is making the right call and who is more likely to be right all of the elders and rational people who have been vetted and trained over a lifetime or someone who is like coming up with rationales why they as a, an exception should deviate from their given nature should like swap genders or do something that you know isn't in this natural law conception so how do you respond to that? I mean, shouldn't there be a consensus between the ideal guardian and the ideal subjective freedom? And doesn't that freedom kind of evaporate if you, there is one correct solution to what you ought to do? Yes, yeah, so this is a hard paradox to kind of uh, resolve. I think the, the underlying principle though, is that the reason why this new version of like democracy or, or monarchy, monarchical constitution is above the Greek the Greek version of it in antiquity, the Greek democracy, is that they allowed slavery to happen in some justified way, even with Plato and Aristotle. Hegel actually says Christianity is a higher level than Greek society, even though philosophy is better, he said back then. We should strive for the philosophical component. But in terms of the actual actualization of spirit, he said Christianity did a better job because it got rid of slavery completely. Jesus kind of came and said the first principle of that philosophy, which is everybody, no matter who you are, no matter what, what, as long as you're conscious and you're the notion, the logic in the centrist realm, you deserve genuine freedom. But Christianity does endorse slavery. Even in, in Paul in the New Testament endorses slavery. Well, I think Jesus, that's why Jesus says, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to liberate people as much as you can be with the poor. I think that's what he means is you're supposed to allow people to actualize the spirit, whether they're a leper, whether they're they were a prostitute, doesn't matter. If you have the capacity to achieve spirit, you should have some way to do that. And I think society often restricts that. And it kind of keeps this artificial between the guardians who know everything, the elders, and then it kind of keeps people down. He says, to prevent the bias from the top or the bias from the bottom. He says, you know, you can, you can have the rule of the mob, which Socrates warned us about, or you can have wisdom of the crowd. All that matters is the level of reason and he says, if you are being suppressed from the top down in some kind of corruption, the only way that the bottom, if they do have more reason than the top, the only way that they can challenge the guardians is through an objective mechanism where the rules are there for everybody to challenge. And whoever has the best reason wins. So it's all about mm -hmm. reason, and implicating reason. So as long as we have that going. But one more thing I would say is in terms of the genders, like um, in some ways you can look at transgenderism or like this fluidity of gender politics as, as abhorrent and terrible and as deviating from the idea. Or you can look at it as actually a higher level of human evolution where we're totally breaking free of the, the physiognomy, the carnality. But there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do that. And there's a caprice way, an abstract way, where you're, you're making the choices out of confusion and you're not sure what to do and, and in the end you regret your choices. Like there's some people that are regretting transgender surgery and stuff like that. That's when we know, okay, that wasn't in alignment with the real reason. But there might be some people who think, yeah, actually, this is where I belong, and they made the right choice, and they're confident in that. All that matters is the reasoning. And when you're young, how do you make that choice? It's like blurred, right? Because are children really rational? There needs to be some kind of limit that we set where we're protecting them as much as possible based on much better measurements of reason. So I would say yeah, okay. focus on reason, genuine reason. Okay, that reason comes first. I 
totally agree with as well, but it's a matter of how do you discern right reason from wrong reason and just rationales for your own like sexual indulgence versus this is for the greater good. And I think in that case, in this sort of social issue, um, you have to look at what is happening at the society-wide scale as a result of this, what's happening in terms of birth rates. Because if more like top-down conservative societies have higher birth rates, and they do globally, and societies that allow more gender fluidity and freedom and anything people want to be have lower birth rates, then the, the future of the earth will go to the top-down conservative. So I think too much freedom is an existential threat, and I think that's actually what's happening with our civilization as a whole and has to be addressed. So I think I don't like the Hegelian emphasis on the freedom here, and I know there's a subtlety to it, but like I said in the beginning, like if you follow Hegel's logic, maybe he justifies in a certain sense his use of the language in the way he wants to use it but my argument is not that the logic is necessarily wrong that hegel uses it's that i disagree with the language that he is using because the language has more than a logical content it has a symbolic content it has a resonance with certain archetypes and the indefinite the infinite has a resonance with that kind of left-handed path that you know more feminine path that uh, receptive rather than active, all the you know adjectives that you give to that in the Pythagorean scheme, it has that. And when that is emphasized as the highest value in society, like in liberalism or libertarianism, you know, freedom-based political systems, uh, you I think you're seeing what we see now, which is we in generally uh, we in general have been feminized and we're not sufficiently ordered, and people aren't able to enter those flow states like you correctly identify. So there's a mixed bag, basically, of truth and untruth, from my opinion, um, and it's a complex thing. So I, I admire that you're trying to do something. I want to see more specifics about, like, what does good art look like in this? What does good law specifically look like in this? And what, how do you build the institutions that build the right laws? But I do have to go, like, pretty much right away, so I'll give you the last word, and then we'll wrap this oh, up. I appreciate that. Uh, I think you're right. I think that we have, so Hegel introduced the, this principle of the next philosophy 200 years ago, and he says when the principle comes on the scene, it comes on in an immediacy, kind of like the idea in a way. And then it negates itself, and it, it, it makes itself plural. And that's where you said the many are the evil, and, and then the one converges. That's, that's only true in the beginning. But actually, he says once the principle permeates the plurality, it actually turns into spirit. And the one and the many become in one spirit, and that's what the spiritual community is supposed to be. And I think that if we make, if we simplify, but if we simplify our educational systems for people by teaching one logic, that essence, all the disparate, different parts of disciplines, physics is warring with chemistry, all these types of things, they're seen as silos that are warring with each other when they're supposed to be a plant like harmony, this idea of working together. If we change the way we do education young enough, then we can get people thinking rationally younger. And then growing into adults that are real philosophers that have this wisdom in our institutions, in our laws, because when they come out with that education, they do make our institutions. And next time, it would be really fantastic to get into those details because we're trying to amplify the voice of putting these this, these kind of simplified laws. Because Hegel is about genuine freedom, but I also said he said the rule of law is really important. So he's doing both, right? Getting into that more and saying what kind of institutions um, result from this um, and what kind of voice do we need? I think we need to win some kind of Nobel Prize thing to really amplify the voice that this logic is necessary. And that would be a great conversation for next time. So I really appreciate you letting me get the last word. I think you're mostly right. We've deviated quite far and we need to kind of come back a little bit. Okay, cool. Very good speaking with you, Spirit Man. Um, curious, you know, what you're going to do. So uh, we'll probably speak again at some point. Um, but yeah, take care. Merry Christmas, everybody. God bless. Can't wait. <laughs> okay. And I really do have to go like right now. So All right, man. Yeah, I'll talk Let to you. Later. All right, bye bye.